Okay guys, so this lecture is going to be covering plants. You guys are probably pretty familiar with plants at this point in time. Um, they're green, they make seeds, um, and things like that. Um, but there's a little more to them. Um, and we're going to go ahead and talk about the different categories of plants, some of the different characteristics that are used to uh, group plants together into those different categories, um, and some of the different important groups of plants. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Well, um, as you probably already also know, uh, plants can be pretty much found everywhere on the entire planet. Um, they can be found growing in the water, on the land, um, really cold environments, really hot environments, pretty much anywhere in between. Um, and plants can come in pretty much every shape and um, size, from tiny little small moss that uh, you probably don't even notice when you walk past it, um, to giant redwood trees um, that stand uh, three and 400 foot tall. Um, so all shapes and sizes in between. And along with bacteria and algae um, producing uh, oxygen for us, plants uh, provide a great source of oxygen um, for life on Earth. Without them doing that, we would no longer be able to survive with the without the oxygen that they produce for us. So let's go ahead and start with the very small um, phylum of plants and work our way up uh, to the little more complex uh, phylums of plants. So we're going to start at the very beginning um, with the simplest plants on the planet called bryophytes. Now, bryophytes, um, you're probably familiar with bryophytes in the form of moss, and this is the most common uh, type of bryophytes. There are quite a, a few different uh, species of mosses, a couple hundred, or a couple thousand, I should say. Um, but along with mosses, you have liverworts and hornworts that you're probably not so familiar with um, that are included in the phylum Bryophyta. And it's the phylum name that includes mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. Um, so anyway, sorry. Um, these guys, uh, mosses and hornworts and things, are tiny little small plants. Um, they don't grow very large, and they're almost exclusively found in wet, moist habitats. Um, and the reason for this is they have to have uh, moisture in their environment um, for their reproductive cycles to be able to complete themselves. Now, these plants do not have uh, seeds, and that's one of the characteristics of lower-end plants. And we'll talk about one of the differences in just a second of uh, when plants start to develop seeds and things. Um, it's a big step forward in the evolutionary uh, uh, tree of plants. Um, that not uh, Plants in the beginning of time didn't produce seeds, and we'll talk about that just a little while later. Anyway, these guys do not produce seeds. Um, they do, however, produce sperm and eggs. Now, pollen, as you understand it, um, is essentially just a little sperm delivery system. So every other plant produces sperm. Um, they just don't produce the seed. Now these guys, being very primitive plants, produce sperm and eggs. No seeds, though. So sperm and eggs, um, since these guys don't move, they obviously can't come in contact with one another um, by uh, being able to move to one another. They have to rely on water for their sperm to be able to swim um, from one location, from the, the male, quote-unquote, portion of the plant, um, to the female portion of the plant uh, to fertilize the egg. So without that water layer um, for the sperm to swim through, um, it would not be able to get to the egg and no fertilization would take place. So no more baby uh, mosses would be born. So these guys can't live in dry habitats. They have to have a wet um, habitat um, for their, to be able to reproduce, and that's why. Now these guys are also very, very, very short, um, and they lack vascular tissue. Now vascular tissue is a very important thing um, that's found in a lot of higher up plants. Now lower plants on the evolutionary chain, um, they tend to lack vascular tissues, and this is one of the characteristics of, a, of another uh, major evolutionary step forward, um, is when plants evolve these vascular tissues. So anyway, what vascular tissues are, um, is it essentially is a, a straw, if you like, that's inside of a tree or a plant or something like that, or in a pump. A straw uh, some, in a pump is essentially what they are. Now, if you've ever left your straw paper sitting in a glass, if you go out to eat at a restaurant um, or just next to it, you notice that the water will run up the straw paper, and that's a cohesion um, and adhesion, just the properties of water and things like that. Well, the same thing happens inside of a plant. Um, the plant, the water, uh, in the, the environment, uh, plants obviously have to drink, so they have to be able to suck up water. And they have their roots that go down in the water, or in the ground, and the roots suck up water. And the water um, will go up just so far um, up the roots via the process of uh, cohesion and adhesion. Now eventually what's going to happen 
is um, gravity is going to start to pull down that water. It's going to get really heavy. Um, it's, so the forces of gravity are going to pull down on the water more than cohesion and adhesion is going to be able to pull it up. So the water will only be able to go up so high um, and then it stops. So how do you get water to the top of really tall plants? Well, you evolve a pump system and a bunch of tubes that move that water around called vascular tissue. And we'll get into that in a little while um, and what the differences are and things like that, how they work. Well, anyway, these guys don't have that vascular tissue, so they have to rely solely on the process of cohesion and adhesion to carry water um, from the roots in the soil to the very top of their, of their structure, their cells, of their plant, quote-unquote. Um, when you have to rely on gravity and cohesion and adhesion to do this for you, you can't grow very tall. Um, once again, gravity can't uh, is going to pull down water very quickly. Water can't go up very high. Um, just pure cohesion and adhesion doesn't doesn't allow it to. Gravity will pull it down. Um, so these guys are limited in their size. They can only get so tall um, because they're stuck um, with that concept of cohesion and adhesion to get water supplied to their cells. They can't suck up water um, to the top of their cells. They have to rely on the uh, um, environment just to pull it up for them kind of thing. So um, they can't get very big. Now these guys exhibit something called an alteration of generations life cycle. Now this is a very odd concept to understand, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to walk through this with you guys. Um, but if you need a little extra information on this one, please feel free to check out the supplemental video section um, for that. Now anyway, um, if you're familiar with genetics or biology one, um, you've understood the term haploid and diploid. Haploid meaning a cell that has half of the chromosomes in it of an adult that's diploid, and diploid meaning that one that has two copies of each chromosome um, in their adult stages. Now anyway, these guys, are most organisms on the planet, are always going to be either haploid or diploid. You will not find both versions in the environment functioning together. Now these guys you will. Um, most plants do this. It's very strange. Not all of them can, but most of them do. Um, this haploid diploid is an alteration of generations life cycle. You can find both haploid adult stages and diploid adult stages um, in of their life cycle in the environment at the same time. It's very strange. Uh, the haploid form is called the gametophyte. It produces gametes, uh, sperm and eggs. You need haploid sperm and eggs, so the haploid gametophyte will produce those haploid gametes. Diploid, on the other hand, the sporophyte will be producing spores, which are going to be diploid. So diploid sporophytes, haploid gametes, uh, sperm and eggs. So this is the uh, gametophyte will produce uh, the dip, uh, diploid sporophyte. And the sporophyte can produce the haploid gametophyte. It's very interesting how this strange this thing works. Um, and the two different forms of the diploid moss and the haploid moss, the gametophyte and the sporophyte, the two different forms often look very different from one another. Um, one of them can be macroscopic, where you can't uh, you can see it with your naked eye, and the other one can be microscopic, where you can't see it. Um, it really just depends on the species, and it's very strange how this works. Now in moss, um, not every single species of plant, but it just in mosses and our bryophytes, um, the gametophyte happens to be the largest of the stages. It is photosynthetic. Um, the sporophyte, on the other hand, is the smaller of the stages, and it is not photosynthetic. It has to live as kind of a parasite on the gametophyte, and I'll show you guys what this looks like in just a second. So here's what we got going up here. Um, and you can kind of see a little bit here what's, what's going on, and I'll talk through this in a second. So, in these guys, like I said, the gametophyte is the predominant life cycle stage. And the gametophyte of a moss, uh, let me just show you guys an easier picture, looks like this traditional moss down here on the rock um, that you're used to seeing. The sporophyte are these long stalk things that poke up. You may have seen these before um, if you walk around and look at moss in your yard. Anyway. So, the gametophyte is that flattened thing right here, the moss that you're familiar with, and the sporophyte is the thing that pokes up um, in the air. So what's going to happen is the gametophyte is going to be haploid. It's going to produce sperm and eggs. One of the sperm is going to be produced over here by one plant, and the other side of the plant or a different plant or whatever is going to produce an egg. Now it rains. Um, the sperm will swim 
from one side of the plant to the other and fertilize the egg. That is the haploid uh, sperm swimming to the haploid egg, uniting to form a diploid uh, zygote. Now that diploid zygote will stay where it's at. It's essentially like a little egg that's been fertilized in that one spot. In fact, that's exactly what it is. Um, and that one little egg, once it's fertilized, will grow. It's diploid now. It's gotten two, one sperm and one egg. It's become diploid. will grow into a diploid sporophyte. Now, this diploid sporophyte will produce haploid spores um, via meiosis. So, a very interesting, strange process here how this works. Um, so, this is asexual reproduction. This is sexual reproduction in these guys. Kind of weird. Um, so, the little haploid spores will float off into the environment um, and start a genetically different gametophyte than the one that they were born from. So, this is genetically going to be the same, um, but the spores that come off of it will be genetically different. Very odd how this process works. Um, so it alternates in between these. The gametophyte is what you will see almost all the time in the environment, and the sporophyte will only be, be uh, produced excuse me, during the reproductive season. You won't see that all year round. It's only going to be produced once the eggs have been fertilized by the sperm um, during their reproductive cycle. Now this process repeats itself over and over and over again in the environment with the spores landing, starting a new cycle of moss. That cycle of moss produces more spores that flow away um, and start themselves over and over and over again um, throughout the environment. So there's three different phyla, sorry, of bryophytes. Um, and they're located uh, all across the world. You can find these things pretty much anywhere you want to look in different, uh, different species of them. Um, but they all kind of look the same. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about what they are. Now, the first phylum is phylum Antherophyta. Now, Antherophyta, they're commonly called um, hornworts. I mean, you can probably see why they call them hornworts. They look like horns poking up out of the ground. Now, the gametophyte um, is the predominant stage, once again. It's what you're going to see 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, these guys like to live near um, moist environments. They need a very wet, um, slick environment, kind of a moist environment for them to live in. Um, around rocks and things like that and dirt um, is where they like to live. Very short, little, small, inconspicuous plants. Um, when the reproductive cycle occurs, the sperm will swim and fertilize the egg, um, producing the sporophyte. Or, uh, that egg will eventually grow into the sporophyte. Excuse me. The sporophyte will then produce um, spores via meiosis, um, and those haploid spores will float off into the environment um, and start a brand new gametophyte somewhere else. It's a very interesting reproductive cycle um, in these guys. And about 100 or so species of these um, have been identified all throughout the world. And then people keep them in their aquariums and things like that. Now, hepatophyta um, are commonly called liverworts. Um, if you're familiar with a hepatologist, um, it's someone who studies the liver or a doctor that specializes in liver work. Um, so hepato um, just means liver, like hepatitis and stuff like that. Um, well, anyway. Um, there's two different types of liverworts. Um, you can find them both in Tennessee. Um, you probably don't see them very often because they're so tiny. Now this is called a thalloid liverwort. Um, thalloid just means flat and squished. This is the traditional liverwort. It kind of looks like a little flat liver. Um, and the other ones are called leafy liverworts. And you can kind of see them over here. They look more like a, a traditional kind of leafy plant structure kind of thing. Now, um, these guys are very interesting. This is the sporophyte um, for the uh, uh, leafy liverworts. Now down here you see the uh, gametophyte, the little leafy part, and these things that look like palm trees that are standing up are the sporophytes. So same concept here, the sperm will travel to the egg over here, fertilize the egg, the egg will develop into the sporophyte, which produces haploid spores, float away into the environment, and start the new process over again. Now, the thalloid liverworts, on the other hand, are kind of weird. I mean, you can see these little uh, circles here. They're called gimme cups. Um, and this is essentially their version of making a bud or cloning themselves. I um, mean, these little jimmy cups or gimme cups are, um, can make and grow into a new thalloid liverwort if they're broken off uh, or just grow off to the side into a new, bigger version of itself and things like that. So this is asexual reproduction um, where they just grow a new version of themselves right out of that little um, cup right there. Now, Bryophyta, where the phylum gets its name from, 
um, moss, typical moss. Um, so, or excuse me, the group, I should say, gets their name from. Um, it's just typical moss, phylum bryophyta. This is all the moss. Um, if you think of moss, this is what moss is. These are the stereotypical moss uh, plants. Now, once again, um, these guys uh, stand up. Uh, sorry, um, this is the gametophyte down here. The sporophyte stands up real tall. Now, the difference between these guys and all the other ones that we've talked about so far is that these guys stand upright all year round. Um, the gametophytes stand up, and that's something that you don't see in the rest of the plants. They tend to be flat, the lower guys. So the gametophyte in these stand up tall, and the sporophytes stand up even taller. So we're getting a little step forward on the evolutionary ladder um, towards getting plants that are a little more erect um, than one another. Now once again, um, sorry, let's just say water, not eater. Um, so uh, these guys require water in their habitat for the sperm to be able to swim through um, to get to the egg. Now, uh, they also lack that vascular tissue. Um, that's that uh, 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 tissue, that kind of a pump system um, that carries water and nutrients around from the top of the plant to the bottom and things like that. Now, here's the stereotypical reproductive cycle of a moss. Now, this is what I'm going to be talking about here, the gametophyte down here in the bottom, this quote-unquote stems and leaves part. Um, and then the sporophyte stands up on a little thing called a stalk. So here's what these things do, essentially how this is how this works. This is stereotypical um, bryophyte reproduction. So let's start with the adult and we'll come back to these two. So we'll start with the adult right here. Um, so the adult's going to produce sperm on one side of the plant and eggs on the other. Um, so essentially what's going to happen is the sperm is going to be um, released uh, from the plant and swim through the water um, to the location of the egg on the other side of the plant. Now you can see here the egg on the moss plant is encased in this little funny uh, structure here. And that's essentially what's going to be extended up on the top of that little stalk here. So it's down here in the, um, or up here I should say, um, in, it's kind of hidden, very tiny, microscopic, um, inside of the leaf. Now the little sperm is going to swim down through this little hole uh, and fertilize the egg inside of this archegonium structure. So once that starts, uh, fertilization has occurred, the zygote will start to defy. Um, and once that's triggered, once the cell, uh, plant realizes that that has occurred, um, it's going to start to extend this little archegonium uh, structure up into the air on a structure called a setae or a stalk. Um, and this is going to lift it high up into the air. Um, so when it is mature, when the uh, capsule is ready to open, that the spores will be dispersed into the wind, into the environment, instead of just you know right there on the plant itself kind of thing. So you want to make sure that you give them the best chance to get away from the uh, original adult as you can. So as the uh, setae grows taller, the capsule grows farther up, um, the capsule will grow more and more spores from the zygote as it divides and divides and divides. Um, the spores will mature and mature and mature, and eventually what's going to happen is this capsule will burst open. Um, it's going to have a little uh, um, thing called an operculum that holds it closed, and underneath that's called, an, called a calyptra, which holds it together kind of like a, um, kind of like a, a, a closed paper clip kind of thing. Um, and the operculum is what's hold, or a, a clothespin kind of thing with a spring on it. Um, and then so the operculum is holding the clothespin shut. Essentially, when everything's ready to be mature, the uh, operculum is burst, is removed, it's broken, broken loose. The calyptra lets go all the pressure that it's under, and it springs open, and all of the spores are instantaneously released and shot under the environment. Now, the spores float around in the environment um, and land somewhere else to grow into a brand new version of the moss. Now, here's how this works in their anatomy. Um, you can see the stems and leaves here, and that's the gametophyte part of the moss. Now, these guys have something called a rhizoid. They don't have roots. They get their water um, from the environment that they live in as well. Um, so not only do they have to rely on water um, to, for their reproduction, they have to rely on water in the environment to be absorbed through their stems and leaves for them to be able to live because they don't have roots. They can't absorb it from the soil. Now, these rhizoids essentially work kind of like a little hold fast. It just holds them to the ground so they don't get washed away or blown away in things from, uh, in the environment. So stems and leaves, the gametophyte part. 
sperm and eggs fertilize right there. The little setae grows up, the capsule is on top. This is the sporophyte. Um, and the uh, haploid spores will be released once the capsule is mature um, and sent off into the environment. Okay, so let's take a step up the evolutionary ladder um, onto ferns. So ferns um, are commonly called pteraphytes. Um, kind of a weird word for them. But these guys are our very first step up um, of plants that get vascular tissue. They don't have seeds, so they're still fairly primitive. But they do have vascular tissue, so they can grow quite large um, when you compare them to our bryophytes. Now, this is what vascular tissue looks like. So essentially what we have here is we've taken a tree trunk and we've cut it in half, kind of like a, a slice of bologna. I um, mean, you're looking inside of the loaf of bologna, um, and this is what you would see inside of the tree trunk if you could do this. Now, you see these holes inside of it. These holes are the vascular tissue. Um, the xylem is going to carry water from the roots and minerals and things like that, water and minerals from the roots, all the way up to the very tip top of the plant to feed the leaves and feed the trunk at the very top of the plant. Um, those at the very tip top of the plant, the leaves and things have to eat too. They need water, they need minerals and things like that. So all of that stuff will be sucked up from the bottom of the ground, um, from the soil, through the roots, and sent through the xylem, which is essentially the uh, a supercharged version um, of uh, cohesion and adhesion pump. Um, sent all the way to the top of the tree, um, carried up by that vascular tissue. Now the leaves at the very tip top of the tree, the green parts of the plant are the only part that's photosynthetic that will be able to produce food. Um, they have to be able to produce enough food in the green parts to feed the non-green parts of the plant um, that aren't photosynthetic. They have to eat too, um, but they can't make their own food. So the leaves will produce a ton of food, a bunch of excess sugar, and send it back down the plant um, via the phloem, which is essentially a bunch of straws that run in the other direction direction, excuse me, that carry sugars um, and glucose and whatnot that the plant has made via photosynthesis down to feed the rest of the plant. So the xylem carries stuff up from the soil, and the phloem carries sugars down from the leaves to the rest of the tree. Um, very interesting concept of how this works, and having both of these things um, allows trees to grow very tall um, and ferns to grow very tall and things like that. They can get around the problem of uh, cohesion and adhesion and gravity with water by having a built-in pump. Um, and they can also nourish the rest of their uh, trees, trunks, and the rest of their uh, leaves and things. Uh, sorry, the rest of their uh, um, stalk and stem and whatnot, their roots, um, by sending the food back down via the phloem. So ferns have been around. Um, for quite a long time, um, but they thrived during the Carboniferous Age, which is, I think is about 120 million years ago. Um, if you've ever watched a dinosaur movie, all those giant ferns, this is essentially when that happened. Now you can see down here, um, this is a fossil of a piece of fern, and this is in a piece of coal. Um, all of the coal that we find today is essentially um, plant remains that have been compressed for thousands and thousands and millions of years. Um, and it essentially was just dead ferns and dead trees and dead mosses and things that piled up on top of one another um, and were compressed uh, by tons and tons and tons of pressure. Now eventually what happened um, is they were uh, compressed hard enough to form rock, um, but every once in a while you can find a fossil um, inside of that coal from what, it's, what it once was. Um, you crack open a big lump of coal um, and you find a piece of a fish, uh, sorry not a piece of fish, a piece of a plant um, inside of that. Um, fish, you, if you find fish in coal, there's a problem. Um, you find plants and pollen grains and little interesting things um, inside of the coal. So ferns. Um, now we're going to take a switch from our gametophyte being the dominant phase to the sporophyte being the dominant phase. Um, so everything from here on out, the sporophyte is going to be the dominant version of that uh, species that you will see in the environment, um, whereas our bryophytes is the gametophyte. These guys also have true roots, um, not that rhizoid system that functions just to hold them to the ground. They also have real leaves and real stems. So they're taking a step up the evolutionary ladder um, in the sense of they have true roots and things like that. They have vascular tissues, but they don't have seeds. They reproduce by spores. So they're still kind of primitive. Well, sperm, uh, ferns, I'll show you guys what this, uh, I don't think I have a picture of it. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. There, I do. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Um, well, ferns, 
they have an underground root system called a rhizome. Um, and this is essentially how this works. So this is the anatomy of a fern. Um, so underneath the ground, um, they have a, a really long stem called a rhizome. And that rhizome just runs underneath the ground. Um, anywhere along that rhizome, a fern leaf can pop up out of that fern. If you recall from our fungi lecture, the hyphae underneath the ground, anywhere along it, the fungus can pop up, the, the mushroom part, quote unquote. Um, and this is essentially the same kind of concept. Um, anywhere along the ground where the rhizome, the underground stem is at, um, a fern leaf can pop up from. So you've got one little fern here, and then one little fern here, and then one little fern here, and you think you've actually got three different fern plants, but in reality it's just one big plant um, with three little different ferns growing off of it. So one big plant, three little different uh, offshoots of the same plant. So uh, attached to that rhizome, are going to be all of the real roots, the true roots that suck up water, that suck up nutrients and things from the soil. Um, so those roots will be attached all along the rhizome, um, feeding the underground rhizome um, and feeding the uh, above ground parts of the fern as well. Well, when a, a fern is first born, um, it's going to be curled up very small. Um, and as it grows, this is going to uncurl. Um, it's kind of like a, if you curl your finger up, um, if you slowly uncurl your finger, and this is essentially how ferns grow. Um, and these are the curled up little leaves on the side um, that will open up as well. And this thing structure here is called a fiddlehead. It's the very earliest form of a, of a developing fern. Um, you can kind of see why they call it a fiddlehead. It looks like a violin with the pegs on it, a uh, violin head. I mean, you can eat these. Uh, they do produce tons of uh, toxic, or not slime, and not toxic, but slime and gross nastiness and stuff inside of them. And so you usually have to cook them two or three times before they're safe to eat, um, in the sense of you don't want to get a bunch of glue and uh, liquid latex and junk inside of your mouth. Uh, so boil them twice, and then you can eat them. Um, and they're actually considered a delicacy in parts of the world. Well, the underside of a fern, um, since this is the sporophyte that we are going to be seeing, the dominant phase, um, is going to be where the spores are going to be produced. So the sporophyte, if you recall, produces the spores. Um, and the sporophyte on the fern is what the big part is, and that's where the sp uh, spores are going to be produced. Now, if you can see all these little black dots on the underside of this fern leaf here, those are called sori, S-O-R-I, sorus, S-O-R-U-S being the uh, plural form. Uh, so, sorry, sorus being the singular form, sori being the uh, plural form. Um, all these little black dots are going to be producing haploid spores. Um, those little haploid spores will be released into the environment um, and land and start another uh, fern colony. So very strange. Now the gametophyte in these guys is very, very small. It's almost invisible. Um, and it sits on the underside of the leaf um, and it will produce the sp uh, um, sperm and the eggs which will fertilize um, to produce the uh, fern that you see here uh, from the rhizome. So very strange for these guys. Um, and once again, they are a primitive plant and they have to require water um, to uh, reproduce. They have not been able to evolve the uh, ability to lose water um, in their uh, requirement for reproduction. So they're still very primitive um, because they require water. Um, they're not that tall. They do have vascular tissues, but they don't have seeds. Um, so they're quite primitive still when you compare them to uh, um, things like trees and uh, fr uh, fruit producing plants and things. So these are a couple of the different phylums of ferns. Um, for the big ones that you may be familiar with, you've probably seen a couple of these. So let's go ahead and talk about what they are. Well, the very first phylum is called Lycophyta, I'm also called club mosses. And you can kind of see why here. It looks sort of like a billy club that a police officer might use or something like that. Um, so there's, these guys are not the most common things on the planet. Um, you see them a lot in um, sold as like Christmas trees and things kind of like that um, around uh, um, Christmas time at Walmart and stuff like that. You see them in uh, stores, little small, little tiny Christmas trees and things from time to time. Um, they have very small little tiny leaves, and you can kind of see them here. Um, those small little tiny leaves called micropiles. Micro meaning tiny, and piles just means leaves as opposed to megaphils or megapiles um, in large plants, big leaves. Um, so these guys are neat. Um, this is the gametophyte, uh, sorry, the sporophyte that you see here that produces the spores. Um, and their spores are flammable, which is very strange. It's called lycopodium powder or flash powder. Magicians use it a lot. Um, and it was also what was used to take photographs back in the day. 
um, they would put it inside of the uh, uh, flash up here, and this would be the uh, flash bulb to light up the person that was having their photograph taken. Um, they would go collect this stuff and uh, uh, put it in a big giant container. Um, it's highly explosive, um, and then they'd just ship it around the nation, and photographers would buy it and whatnot. Um, but nowadays, it's a little difficult to get, um, and more uh, synthetic products have kind of replaced it for people that are interested in this type of photography. Sphenophyta. You're probably familiar with this. You've probably seen it, although you may not know you have. Um, this is called horsetail, um, or equisetum. Um, it's a very common plant that's used around um, the world for landscaping, um, and they use it to make walls with it. almost always grows to the same height. Um, so it's uh, pretty easy to control, and it grows very quickly. Um, it's all bunched together and things like that. Well, they do have leaves. Um, they're just very tiny, and you can kind of see these black bands that grow around them. Um, it's, uh, if you could zoom in on the black bands, it kind of looks like this a little bit, and that's their little tiny leaves all the way around the band, those little tiny leaves. Now, um, these are interesting little uh, plants. This is the spore-producing cone up here. It's called a strobilus. Um, so they're very strange how they work. Um, their cell walls, if you've ever picked up equisetum before, you, it, uh, you felt it, and it's quite scratchy, it's quite hard. Um, they're known as scouring rushes, is their old time name. And the reason for that is their cell walls contain silica, or glass. They get it from the soil. Um, they suck up all the silica minerals and things like that, and they put that silica minerals in their cell walls of their plants. Um, that silica... Uh, keeps things from wanting to eat them, uh, so they don't really have to worry about getting nommed on by a cow or a deer or something like that. It doesn't really want to eat the glass shards inside of their uh, cell walls. It would be very unpleasant. Um, if you rub them together, you can hear them kind of make a scratchy sound, kind of like that sort of thing. Um, and you can hear the glass inside them. You can feel it, too. It can cut you if you're not careful. Um, but a long time ago, people figured out that if they could take a handful of uh, equisetum, um, you could use it to clean pots and pans and things. Um, so they were commonly referred to as scouring rushes. So if you've ever heard an old book um, mention the term scouring rush, that's what they're referring to. Um, there's only a couple of species that are extant, uh, um, extant today. Only one genus is Equisetum. Um, there's a couple of different species of Equisetum. But a long time ago, these species were very prevalent, lots of them. And they grew quite large, a couple, five or six feet around, and about 20 or 30, 40 feet tall. And we have fossils of them. Um, so those so species are obviously extinct nowadays. Um, so it's uh, thought that ferns liked higher levels of carbon dioxide um, in their environment than we have now and warmer environments than we have now. Um, so a lot of fern species went extinct a very long time ago. Uh, phylum Silophida. Um, these are commonly called whisk ferns. You can kind of see it looks sort of like a whisk. Um, they sell these a lot at Home Depot and uh, science classes and things like that, like to keep them, um, simply because this is what's thought to be what the most primitive uh, plant on the planet uh, that evolved um, out of the water looked like. Um, this is essentially what a plant would look like if you ask someone to put the basic characteristics of a plant together without anything else to it. It has leaves. It doesn't have leaves. Um, it produces spores. It does produce its own food via photosynthesis, and it has roots. But that's really it. Um, it doesn't really do anything fancy, but it is uh, does check all the boxes of being a plant. Um, so this is kind of what uh, most scientists think that the very first uh, plant that evolved, um, successful plant, looked very similar to. Now, you can see the little yellow dots here. These are the spore-producing structures. Um, and this is how we get uh, these spores. The little uh, yellow dots will go away um, when this plant's not reproducing. And there's not a lot of fossil evidence to support um, this idea of what the early plants looked like. Um, but it does make sense if you think about it. It's a very primitive uh, functioning plant. It would make sense that the very first plants would be very primitive as well um, and would probably look something similar to this. We do have fossils of this one that go back a very long time, um, but not enough to support that it was the very first type of plant that evolved. Well, and then we get into our real true ferns. Um, so the ones before that are just very similar to ferns. Um, and then we get into phylum Pterophyta, what the group um, ferns and fern allies is named for Pterophyta. Um, these guys are most abundant in warm and moist climates. Uh, remember, they have to have um, 
water to complete their reproductive cycles. Um, so the more moist it is, the better it is. They like a temperate rainforest, um, things like that. They're found in the Smoky Mountains here um, and things like that where there's tons of rain, tons of moisture, um, and it's quite warm. So that's what they like. Uh, they do have those large leaves called fronds. You've probably heard that term before if you've ever watched any fit body getting fanned with one. Fan me with a palm frond um, kind of thing. Now, palms are not this, not ferns, so don't don't misuse that. They just use the same term. Anyway, um, we talked about the concept of a fiddlehead, um, a little tiny baby fern um, that as it uh, roll, uh, matures, it will unroll out. So you can see here, this is a tree fern. Um, this thing probably stands about 30 or 40 foot tall. Our little coiled up fiddleheads over here, um, our sorae over here, um, and then just a big field of ferns over there in the tropics. So here's our anatomy of our fern. We've got our frond and things like that. Um, a stike, uh, 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 stipe, sorry, the stalk. Um, and our rhizome and our roots and things like that, our little fiddlehead. So the life cycle of a, f a, sp uh, a fern is pretty simple. It's kind of the same as all the rest of them, um, except for this time you see the sporophyte and not the gametophyte. So the gametophyte in this case looks like a lot like a very uh, flat version of kind of a thalloid liverwort. It's kind of a little tiny microscopic uh, fern. It will produce the sperm and the eggs, um, which will travel off of the um, uh, sorry um, off of the plant um, as they mature. The sperm and the eggs will swim to one another, fertilize. The egg will start to develop. Um, the zygote, the zygote will grow into the sporophyte, um, and the sporophyte eventually will develop into the sorus um, on the underside of that leaf. Now, the leaf itself um, has ton tons of sorus underneath it, um, and the little sori will produce the spores inside on little structures called sporangium. That's okay if you don't know that. Um, the little sporangia will open up with the spores inside. The little spores will be dispersed into the environment via the wind. Um, and the little spores will land somewhere, start a new gametophyte over, which will essentially grow into the ground, starting a new stalk, um, a new rhizome, and things like that. Now, as this little gametophyte grows, you can see the sporophytes will eventually grow up into the um, stalks that produce the sporus, the sorus. Um, so this is how this cycle works. The little sporophyte, you can see here, is going to grow up into another one. Uh, the little fiddlehead here, they grow up quite large into the mature sporophyte leaves here. It's a very odd little life cycle. Um, and you can find both the haploid and diploid stages of these guys in the environment at the same time. We don't have that as uh, an organisms that do not practice um, alterations of generations life cycle. Now let's take a step up the evolutionary ladder. Um, not super far up, but one more than our ferns, to gymnosperms. Now, what does this word here mean? Sperms mean sperm, and gymno means nude, or sperm actually means seed, we should say that. So, nude seeds. Now, they have seeds, but they're nude seeds. Now, what does that mean? Well, if a seed's in a, uh, a fruit, or um, it's not nude. So, these are things that produce seeds, but not fruits. Um, things that produce seeds on cones, um, and these are commonly called conifers. Gymnosperms, the other name is conifers. So, let's talk about these guys. Um, you're familiar with these if you've ever used the term evergreen, um, things that don't go uh, brown in the wintertime and don't drop their leaves. Um, so the characteristics of a gymnosperm is that it has a seed that is produced on some sort of cone-like structure. Um, their seeds are almost commonly, uh, almost always um, produced on some sort of scale-like structure, some sort of wing-like structure, things like that. Um, and these guys also exhibit that alterations of generations life cycle, um, with the sporophyte being the dominant phase that you see the tree itself. Um, and then the gametophyte is totally dependent on the sporophyte, and the gametophyte um, usually lives within inside the tree. It's very, very tiny, um, and you would probably never know it was there or even be able to see it kind of thing. So very strange um, how these uh, organisms work. Now, once again, I'll post uh, the supplemental videos if you want a little more clarification on that alterations of generations life cycle. Um, so pine cones, Let's talk about pine trees and things like that. Um, since this is the most stereotypical version of a cone producing tree, hence the name pine cone, um, pine trees are referred to as monoecious. Mono meaning one. Um, so one plant can reproduce with itself. Um, that means one plant produces both male and female uh, parts on the same tree. So you get male cones, which are these down here. Um, they look kind of like little uh, corn dog sort of things. And then you get the female cone, 
which is the stereotypical pine cone um, that you're familiar with. So essentially the tiny little, um, this is the sporophyte, the cone, uh, the tree will be producing the spores on the uh, sporophytes here. Um, these are called microsporophylls, tiny sporophytes that produce the micro, so meaning sperm, micro is the, the bio, bio, uh, botany term for sperm, mega is the botany term for egg, very confusing, I understand, this kind of go, roll with it, I didn't choose those words, uh, so anyway, um, the sperms the going to be produced here, um, and essentially blah blah blah, um, it's essentially, I'll talk about how sperm and egg work in just a second, so kind of bear with me for a second, no, I'm in the sense of a pollen, so anyway, um, our female cone, this is the female cone up here, um, they start out closed. You've probably seen a closed pine cone before, and as they mature, they open up, they separate out, um, and then these little seeds down here, this is the seed, um, the seeds right here, this is the little uh, wing that's attached to, and it will be released into the environment. Now, how does this whole process work? Well, okay, so this is a pollen grain right here. This is the whole process. Um, so I'm going to kind of take a couple of steps back here to this guy. So this is going to be producing pollen grains right here. Pollen grains are going to be produced inside of these, and each one of those pollen grains is going to hold inside of it four sperm cells. So those four sperm cells, you can see one of them here, one of them here. Now they're going to be rolled up inside of this pollen grain right here. So this is a fully um, withdrawn pollen grain. You can see the little dots of sperm inside. Now what's going to happen? is the spore um, is going to carry the pollen within it. So the pollen the spores are going to open up, release the pollen, which is essentially the spore, into the environment. The pollen will float around into the environment and land on a female sporophyte, um, the female egg. So, sorry, the gametophyte, sorry, not the sporophyte, the gametophyte. Um, so this is the male gametophyte. The female gametophyte, which produces the egg will be somewhere else, um, and the little the um, male gametophyte will produce this, the um, pollen grains, which will float into the um, environment and land on the female gametophyte, the egg portion. Now, what happens is the seed itself, um, or sorry, the yeah the seed um, is the egg, and in pine trees, the egg, the seed, sits down here at the bottom of the cone. You can see here, the, this is the inside of the cone, if you were kind of to slice it in half, and this is what you'd see. So these are the little wings, the little uh, parts of the pine cone. These are the seeds right here, um, and the little scales that come off. So the pollen grain is going to float through the wind, and it's going to land right around in here somewhere on the, on the uh, female pine cone. Now once it does that, this is called the pollen tube, this long spindly little thing here, and this is the sperm delivery system. The pollen tube will make its way from the pollen grain down through this gap right here, penetrate into the egg, the ovule. Um, the sperm that's inside of that little pollen grain will swim down the pollen tube, down through the egg, fertilize the egg, um, and then that egg will start to develop into a zygote, um, which will eventually form a fully developed seed, um, which as it grows will cause the spine cone to spread open um, and eventually the pine cone will become open fully as the seeds mature, releasing the seeds into the environment where they can go float off into the environment and start a brand new plant somewhere else. So that's essentially reproduction in pine cones and pine trees, a very strange way to do this. Um, so uh, pollen grain essentially lands on the female cone thing, the little pollen tube travels down, um, the sperm, which you can see here, travel down through the little pollen tube, fertilize the egg, um, starting the whole process over again. And there are four phylums of uh, conifers that are really of interest to humans. Um, there's more than that, but there's really only four um, that we're going to be super concerned with. Cycadophyta, phylum cycadophyta. You've uh, probably seen these before. You may have one of them in your house. Um, they're called cycads. People use these things a lot for landscaping. They live a really long time. Um, some of the ones that we have around now are about a thousand years old or so. They've had them um, on record for that long. People wrote when they planted them and things a very long time ago, or they've just uh, carbon dated them um, and things like that. They've been able to tell how long they grow. Now, they're very ancient, primitive plants. Um, they do produce seeds. 
Um, so they're a little more complex, but they're hard as rocks. Their uh, leaves are very sharp, very hard, um, and that's to prevent things from eating them. They grow very slowly, um, which is also a very primitive trait. It's things that don't grow very fast, and things that live very long um, tend to be very ancient, evolutionarily speaking. Um, now you can see here, this is the cone. This is the um, female cone here. Um, that's going to be fertilized. Um, the male cone is going to be significantly smaller than that. Um, and this is the female cone of our cycads. Um, when this female cone tree is not in, or when this female cone is not ready or being produced, um, it will break off um, and die. And then the cycad just looks like a normal cycad without the big cone in the middle. Um, so once again, seeds on cones are the characteristics of all of our conifers here. So Ginkgothida. Um, is another phylum of conifers that you're probably familiar with but didn't ever think of as conifer. Um, so these guys are commonly used as landscaping trees, members of the Ginkgothida family. Um, and there's only one species, which is Ginkgo biloba. Um, it's called biloba. Um, its leaf looks like a heart, two lobes, biloba. It's characteristic of this tree. Now, um, it doesn't look like it's going to be um, producing cones. Um, you have male trees and you have female trees, so these guys are dioecious, unlike our uh, pine trees, which are monoecious. Um, male trees and female trees, one of each gender um, for the tree. They're not the same, both genders on the same tree, so dioecious. Male trees produce pollen, makes perfect sense, and female trees produce cones. But their cones look more like fruits than cones, which is kind of strange. Um, now the fruits of these trees, the, they're not fruits, they're cones. They look like fruits, but they're not. Their cones are housed within this little protective ball. Um, this little protective ball will rot away, exposing a tiny little pine cone underneath. And that's why these guys are considered um, phylum, uh, uh, or in the in the cycad, or sorry, in the uh, conifer group, um, because they do produce actual cones. Now, um, the female versions of this tree um, and the male versions of this tree in the fall both turn this color yellow. They're beautiful. They're wonderful to look at. They're highly sought of, uh, after for decoration for landscaping. Um, and also their leaves are very pretty and things like that. But these fruits here, sorry, these cones, as they, uh, as they rot, this uh, nasty flesh around the cones, as it rots, it contains butyric acid, um, which smells just like soured milk or dog poop. Um, and if you get it on your tree, or if you step, have a female tree around, um, and you get this stuff on your tr uh, shoes or on your clothes or on your hands and stuff, it's just not going to go away. Um, and you will smell horrible um, for weeks at a time. Um, so if you have a landscaper or you want to use some of these, um, make sure that you um, get the male versions of the tree um, and not the female. The males don't produce the uh, cones. The, they don't smell bad. Um, and you get that wonderful um, color change as well without the uh, horrible benefits of the smell. Um, it's been used for a really long time. The bark of these trees um, has been used for a really long time um, as a memory supplement. Um, and they, they dry it out and, and grind it up and stuff. I'm not sure if it works, but uh, you know people take it. So there is that. Nettophyta. Um, a very interesting little phylum that's native to the United States. This is often called Mormon tea. Um, and it contains, it's a little short, little uh, scrub-like looking bush thing. Um, produces very small little cones. Um, and it actually, inside of it contains ephedra, um, which is essentially like methamphedra, methamphetamine kind of thing. Uh, Pseudoephedrine, it's in that same kind of class of uh, stimulants. So it's a, a sort of like easy, um, uh, a little more uh, souped up caffeine kind of stuff. Um, and Mormon pioneers, as they were traveling across the uh, um, United States in the 1840s, um, as they were pushed west, um, figured out very quickly that they could grab this stuff along the way, um, crack it into a, bot a pot of boiling water, um, and it would sub extract all the ephedra out of it, and then if you drank it, um, it would give you a nice little boost of energy. So this is how that got the na name Mormon tea. So you can find this all around the uh, southwestern United States. Um, and then the one that you're probably most familiar with is coniferida. Um, and these are our conifer trees, our stereotypical um, evergreen conifers. Um, these are typically found worldwide. Um, they grow very quickly, very tall, and very skinny, um, which makes them perfect for lumber. 
You can get a lot of good boards out of one of these types of trees. They grow very quick. They're quite soft, which means they're pretty easy to cut. Um, they don't take a lot of time to grow um, and stuff like that. So you can harvest a lot of wood from them, um, a lot of straight wood that's very usable. Now, if you see here, um, this is, tends to be what pine trees look like in the southern part of the um, United States. Um, if you go a little more farther uh, north, um, we get spruce trees and fir trees and things. Now, they look very similar, um, but the reasons why these trees are restricted is you don't really get a lot of pine trees farther north in Kentucky. And you don't really get a lot of these guys farther south unless somebody plants them. Now, the reason for this is how they have to deal um, with um, ice and snow. Uh, pine trees are notoriously brittle. Conifers, they have soft wood, it's notoriously brittle. Um, and if it gets too much weight on it, it'll snap and shatter. So pine trees, their limbs are not evolved to handle the weight of lee uh, snow and ice and stuff building up on them. Um, so if they get too much ice on them, their leaves will break, their trunks will break, and the tree will die. So they really can't grow in areas that are too cold, so they're kind of stuck in the uh, southern part of the United States. Um, or around the, or the world that's warm, I should say, not just us. Um, but anyway, these guys over here, um, in, these work more like an umbrella. Um, their leaves and limbs and branches and things collapse in um, and fold in when they get weight on them. So then um, instead of breaking like an umbrella that doesn't fold and just shattering like these guys, um, these types of trees in the north, um, their leaves and uh, branches and things fold in like an umbrella. Um, so that's why they don't break. So conifers are very interesting, um, very, very, very useful um, for humans, though. And these are our stereotypical um, cone-producing trees. Um, if you think of a pine cone, um, this is what you're thinking of. Your Christmas trees, Douglas firs, and things like that also produce little small cones. You may have seen them um, and things like that. Life cycle of a pine cone, also very similar to the rest of them. Um, you have the pine cone that falls, uh, the, the pollen fertilizes the pine cone. Um, and things like that. So if you want to follow along with that, you're more than welcome to here. And our last little bit is going to be over angiosperms, and this is our last group of plants. Now, angio means um, in a vessel or uh, container, and sperm means sperm. So f uh, sperm inside of a container or fruits, sperm inside of a fruit, eggs inside of a fruit, and so kind of the, what's going on here. So these are going to be plants that produce fruits. So flowering plants and fruit producers. And there's 416 families of these, 300,000 known species, the most diverse group of plants on Earth, and they've been uh, they evolved around 230 million years ago. This is when plants took that step forward um, from seeds on cones that are just exposed to the air um, to the evolutionary step of forming some sort of fruit. Um, some sort of production, uh, protective structure um, around your seed. Now, fruits pr uh, provide quite a few things. Um, fruits are food. Um, the larger the fruit, um, I'll just go over here. Um, the inside of a fruit, you can see here if you cut an apple. The part you eat is food for the developing um, baby plant inside, food for the eggs, uh, the embryo, the seeds inside of the uh, apple when it's ready to grow. The other thing that it does is it's also going to provide a nice, sugary-rich, um, tempting treat for another organism to come along and eat it. And then when that organism comes along and eats the fruit, it's going to hopefully eat the seeds, um, and then the seeds will be carried around through the environment and passed to that organism's feces, um, and then a new plant can start somewhere else. It's also going to provide protection. Um, a seed just sitting on the ground or a seed inside of an apple, um, both one of them is going to have significantly more protection than the other. So seeds are very useful. Um, it also allows you to disperse um, maybe by water. You could float from place to place and things. It allows you to easier seed dispersal. Quite a few good things come from having seeds. Um, now, one of the big way to now we're not going to talk about all the different groups of angiosperms. We're just going to talk about the big characteristics of all these things and what they have. Now, one of the big ways to break apart our two characteristics of angiosperms here these are, uh, is looking at how they develop from a seed. If the organism itself, if the species, um, is going to develop one leaf or two, so this is the one leaf over here, and two leaves over here, one leaf first or two. If an organism develops one leaf first, these first leaves are called seed leaves or cotyledons, 
Um, if an organism develops one cotyledon first, it's called a monocot. Mono meaning one, one cotyledon. You can see that here, grass. Um, and then our dicots, two cotyledons, are going to be things like trees, um, uh, flower-producing uh, things like that, um, things like uh, like roses and stuff. Um, so grasses. Um, our monocots are a little more simplistic version of our angiosperms. They do fulfill angiosperms. They do make fruit, but very simplistic. Um, and our dicots, the little more complex versions um, of our angiosperms, kind of the quote-unquote peak, if you like, um, of plant evolution. So let's go ahead and talk about how this works. So key characteristics here of plants um, that produce fruits is the presence of flowers, fruits and flowers. You have to have a flower to produce a fruit, and a fruit is nothing but a uh, fertilized flower. So let's talk about how this works. There's two types of flowers. There's a complete flower and an incomplete flower. This is a complete flower. I'll talk about what an incomplete flower is in just a second. This is, has a complete flower, has both the male portions, the stamens, and the female portion, the pistil, in the same flower. Male and female on the same flower. An incomplete flower has one or the other, but not both. Okay, so here's how this works. We'll talk with the male portion first and talk about what's going to happen here. So, pollen is released into the environment. Pollen floats off into the environment, and it's going to float around in the environment. It's going to land right here on top of the female portion of the plant called the pistil, female portion of this flower here called the pistil. It's going to land on the portion of the plant called the stigma. Now, right here, the pollen is going to form that pollen tube. We talked about the pollen tube in our gymnosperm. It's no different here. And the pollen tube is going to sp uh, worm its way all the way down through the style here, which is the middle of the, the uh, pistil, all the way down into the ovule, the ovary here, where the eggs are contained, the, uh, the ov ovary right here. So once that little pollen tube gets down into the ovary, the sperm will be released from the pollen up here, swim down through the pollen tube, um, out into the ovary and fertilize each one of the ovules or the eggs inside, forming a zygote. Once those zygotes are fertilized, they will start to swell and grow. Um, and as they grow, essentially, you can see what happens down here. As they grow, the little seeds will grow and grow, which will eventually become our apple seeds. Um, they will grow and swell, and the um, outside layer of that ovary will start to grow and swell as well to prepare for having fruit, uh, food inside to nourish the uh, eggs and things, nourish the babies. Um, so it will swell and swell and swell. Um, the flowers, the uh, pistil, sorry, the uh, um, petals will eventually fall away, um, and the what was once a flower will become our apple. Now you can see up here. Um, this is the apple up here on the top, and the flower right here, and you can see the parts of the apple that are left behind. You can see the original part where it was stuck to the flower is the part on the bottom of the apple where it was originally going to be attached um, at the bottom. Very interesting how this works. You can see the inside of the uh, flower, where it originally was as well, where it fell away, um, right here, the receptacle. Um, you can see where the receptacle was that held um, the original uh, ovary in place. So very strange how a flower works to develop um, into a fruit. So there are multiple different types of fruits, quite a few of them actually, um, and it has to do um, with how they develop from um, as an embryo. Um, is it one embryo that's going to be fertilized at a time inside of there? Um, this is not. Um, is it going to be more than one embryo that's fertilized at the same time, or more than one embryo on side of more than one embryo at the same time? So how this works depends on what type of fruit you get. Um, if you have one ovary that's fertilized at the same time, like our apple here, um, you're going to get one fruit, one seed, one, or one ovary, one fruit, one flower, one fruit. Very simple on how that one works. Now you can see here our aggregate fruit, like a strawberry. If we zoom in on our strawberry here, if you've ever seen a strawberry plant up front, up close, it has lots of little tiny dots all over the surface of those plat flowers. It has tons of different pistils, 50, 60 different little pistils on it, and then you can see them here, all the little different pistils. All of those little different pistils can all be fertilized. 
Now, when all those little different pistils are fertilized, they all start to swell at the same time. And when they all start to swell at the same time, they all grow into one another, making something called an aggregate fruit. Multiple different ovaries were fertilized and all grew into one another. Now, over here, you have something called a multiple fruit, where multiple different ovaries from multiple different ovules were f fertilized at this different that's the same time, um, and then grew together to form clusters of fruits. So this would be something like a blackberry or a raspberry. If you can pull one of the individual little berry thingies off in the middle, um, that's one of the individual little ovaries that was fertilized. Whereas over here, we had one ovary, lots of uh, eggs inside kind of thing, forming our aggregate fruit. So very strange um, how the different types of fruits form. Um, and the different types of fruits are also used to break up angiosperms and their classifications. So you can see the different types of fruits here um, that are found in the angiosperm classifications. Um, and they get different names based on how they work. These are dry fruits over here. Our inhandescent is the other the scientific name for dry fruits, so Samara. Um, you've probably seen these before. These are maple tree, the little hel helicopters, Akeens, um, going to be your uh, um, sunflower seeds, um, the seeds on top of a, uh, um, a strawberry, um, and stuff like that. Um, and then you get your fleshy fruits over here. Um, which are, so Akeens, the, the seeds of the strawberry, the little dots right there, by the way, not the fleshy part. Um, a droop is going to be a hard seed on the inside, things like cherry pits or peach pits or mango pits and things. Uh, pomes or apples, soft fruits with multiple ovaries inside. Berries are soft, fleshy fruits all the way through with multiple ovaries all the way through them. Um, Hesperidiums have things called um, septums inside. Um, or types of berries, so different types of fruits um, get their different names and classifications, which also lead um, to dividing up the classifications of angiosperms. So that's pretty much all I've got for you guys um, over the different types of plants, some of the broad characteristics of plants, how plants are classified, um, and a little walk up through the evolutionary development of plants from uh, very simple plants that lack seeds, um, that don't have vascular tissue through vascular tissue but no seeds, um, to vascular tissue and seeds, um, and then vascular tissue, seeds, and fruits. Um, so I hope this has been useful for you. Um, if you have any other questions or anything that you'd like to, um, me to elaborate on, feel free to send me an email. Um, if not, have a good rest of the day.